had her first physical therapy session before she left the hospital, and then Annette took her back today for her second physical therapy session, and um, slept in the recliner last night. So far, so good. So um, I appreciate the prayers, and I know Annette does too, and um, we just you know, always are thankful for our church family who prays for our family. So, um, and thankful to a God who's good and gives us opportunities to do things to get better. And um, so I appreciate that. Someone have a request? Okay, Victoria. certainly will. Um, I had a chance to talk to our chairman of our board on the D6 family ministry who pastors in Flat Rock, Michigan, and uh, we were talking about um, just how quickly cancer can take people. Um, His wife was diagnosed um, and 24 days later passed away. Um, And um, it just brings me back. My niece, and you've heard me, many of you prayed, well, Maybe some of you knew about it. Um, we were in North Carolina at the time, but my 32-year-old niece uh, was diagnosed on December the 30th and died January the 8th, uh, and it was just like 10 days. So you know, sometimes it's just uh, brutal, and uh, so I know um, you just don't feel like you have time to say your goodbyes and uh, even think about it. And so these families certainly need our prayer. Mike is doing well. But he's had some time. This family obviously has not had much time to to deal with the grief, and so let's make sure we remember them. Someone else? Yes, Carol? Our son is traveling a lot. Um, They left Connecticut last week and will spend the night on Saturday night to South Carolina. And tomorrow, no, Friday, they're headed back up this way to go home, and they're going to spend the weekend with us at the cabin. Okay. All right, well, maybe there's been a change of heart. So we pray for that. Lord can change anybody, right? Right? Brother Ray? Stitch up the nerve, and um, if not, then it looks like she's going to be in pain for the rest of her life. And then, uh, and then Ashley, she, her, she's back in the hospital again with her kidneys. Um, and uh, just so, so many that are mostly salvation related. All right, let's remember these. Yes, Bob? Yes. Uh, to praise um, my work, the Coast Guard Marathon on last weekend, and had a chance to have dinner with the commandant of the Coast Guard. And she was telling me that um, the cleanup from Baltimore, uh, Scott, that's Scott King Bridge, is going. Actually, a little better than expected. It's a little like with. So it's crazy. Yeah. Um, one of our own church members um, was, at least for part of it, was the lead investigator of that Key Bridge incident, Matt Meskin, who was just joined the church the last time we had membership, and he's been traveling back and forth. I know he would probably desire your prayers, because I'm sure that's not an easy thing to oversee. 
Um, and then um, many of you may know the name uh, or at least heard it. If you have any knowledge or history with uh, Southeastern uh, Free Will Baptist College, Dr. Russ Moots, uh, who was um, here at Virginia Beach when we were in college here and the college was at Gateway on Gateway campus. Um, Dr. Moots is one of the few professors that has been with the college all 41 years. Uh, he is the, um, he was an academic dean, but he also has been the, the chairman of the teacher department. But a few months ago, he had brain surgery. It was malignant. Uh, we honored him at the conference this year, renamed the teacher scholarship, the Russ Moot Scholarship. But he probably, unless the Lord intervenes and does a miracle, that was probably his last conference before he goes to heaven. Um, they're not expecting a, a much, you know, it could just happen at any time. But it's interesting, the, you know, one of the things they described, you know, one of the co-workers got up and talked a little bit at the alumni dinner and talked about how faithful he had been, and which is true of Dr. Moots. But um, even with brain cancer and slowing down and being in a wheelchair, every Sunday he teaches his Sunday school class. Uh, just a very, very faithful, uh, and will continue to do it as long as he can. Um, just, just a really steady, even those of us that weren't in teacher education just love Dr. Moots. He, he was just brought a calming presence. Uh, please pray for him. His name is Russ Moots. Uh, pray for him and his um, dear wife, Vicki. And um, I know that they would appreciate it very much. Someone else? Brett? Amen. Every time Brett talks about being up where he can see people, um, it reminds me. In fact, I have passed Brett before going, he was headed toward Norfolk. This is when I first came, and I think he honked my horn, about scared me half to death. He honked the horn, waved at me. But um, when I tried out to be the pastor in Richmond, one of the men there, the McPeak, many of you may know the McPeaks, but Brother McPeak was driving um, Annette and I and Matthew to take us out to dinner. And he was in a little minivan and we were on 95 and this big tractor trailer came up and I could have reached out and washed his windshield. <laughs> and uh, I said, Brother McPeak, I said, uh, this guy's getting awful close. And he said, he'll move over. <laughs> so Brett, I'm glad you look out. Um, I didn't know if I would make it past that night. Um, but um, anyway. I don't, that really doesn't have anything to do with our prayer request tonight or our just, just a little humor. But um, anyone else before we pray? Yes, Brother Jack? Unspoken. Unspoken, okay. Uh, Laura? Craig's just been, with that, all the allergies and everything, he's just been really kind to me yesterday. And after it's been about six weeks in nagging, he finally can convince, I was convincing him to go to the doctor, and he's on steroids and has an inhaler, but He's been a waste and a good amount. So mm. Just God's hand on him. All right. Yes. Uh, keep praying for Troy Edwards. He's um, been doing chemo and he's at the point where he doesn't keep anything down for a long time. Okay. Let's remember this. It seems like tonight just a lot of folks sick or suffering with some type of um, health issue. And um, we always want to keep keep people in mind. Those are hard things to go through, whether they're little or, you know, small or great. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And um, Keith Wood, I'm going to ask you if you would to stand and lead us in prayer tonight. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. 
to do your most perfect will. Father, please, the prayer request tonight, touch those people. Let them know that you love them, that you have their best interest in heart, and that the things that you have to do in your will. Father, we thank you for all your many great mercies and your great blessings every day. Please lead us and guide us in the word tonight. I want you to the pastor as he gives your word. That it would be what you would have us to hear, and that we would take it to heart and live it. Lord, I thank you. I give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish up Revelation 3 tonight, finish up the churches, and, um, and then get into chapter 4, uh, which I'm looking forward to, um, and hopefully you are, and it sort of gets into that catching away, and then the, what happens after the catching away of the church, um, and so tonight I'm going to just cover two churches. Uh, I know that each church we could cover a week, and I, I chose to do each church a week at a time, but I just felt like, um, you know, we want to we want to pick up to where I think most people are interested more so. I think we ought to be interested in all of it, but I do understand in the times that we're living in, people are probably interested in chapter 4 through chapter 19 right now more than they are uh, everything else. But um, Revelation 3, we're going to talk tonight about the church at Philadelphia and the Laodicean church. Um, in verse 7, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he, hath, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou that hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So my dad um, was in the garment business for years, and every once in a while he would have to fly to New York City via, uh, or really um, with one ad on stop, and that was always Philadelphia. And I'll never forget how many times, it was just, you know, several times that he would come back from that New York City trip and saying that he had gone through Philadelphia and he would say, how in the world they ever named that the city of brotherly love, I will never understand. <laughs> and so, uh, now we used to, when we lived in Delaware, we enjoyed going to the historic district in Philadelphia. But we tried to stay out of several of the sections of Philadelphia. Um, if you've never been to a football game there, don't. Um, uh, or go with a bodyguard, I can just tell you that. In fact, it was so bad uh, in the, you know, a few years ago that the Eagles actually built in their new stadium, Lincoln Financial Field, a, a courtroom where they would have a judge on site to prosecute fans that would break the law in during the ball game. Uh, what's that? Yeah. That's what I said. It's in Lincoln Financial Field. That is. Oh, you're talking about the, it was in Veteran Stadium? Yeah. It started in Veteran Stadium, but it carried over and they would, you know, they would prosecute them right there and, and then take them to jail. Um, they booed Santa Claus. They, um, you know, they would throw snowballs at, at you know, uh, children's choirs. I mean, it, it was, and, and it's not all of them, on, I mean, really. It seemed like the higher in the stadium you got, 
And I only went to one game. A guy in the church had four tickets. And I, I told my boys, they said, when are you going to take us? I said, never. <laughs> uh, for those of us who are Dallas Cowboy fans, um, one of the first things that happened when I went is they had a Terrell Owens jersey and they were roasting hot dogs over it. They were burning it in the parking lot and nobody was getting onto them. I mean, it was just like, it was nuts. But, and I know everybody in Philadelphia is not that way. We really did enjoy the, we'd go see the Liberty Bell and the Betsy Ross house and there was a nice section, Independence Hall. There was a really nice section of Philadelphia in the outskirts of Philadelphia, it's a beautiful city. But my dad used to say, how did they call that the city of brotherly love? Now, obviously, you know, this is not the Philadelphia of Pennsylvania that's in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, I'm not insulting your intelligence uh, by telling you that. But the reason I tell you that is because my brother-in-law was in a church where he was preaching through the book of Philippians. And a man raised his hand and said, well, I've been to the Philippines. I know those people. Um, and he was serious. So just want you to know that I'm not insulting your intelligence. I just want to make sure everybody knows this is not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. But it was called, it does mean, the name means brotherly love. We get the Greek word phileo. It's one of the three Greek words, agape, eros, and um, one of the three popular ones, and phileo. And so you're immediately dealing with, in this passage, um, people who loved each other and loved the Lord. Um, it, it represents the missionary church really of the past 250 years with the exception uh, of occasional mission ventures. The churches of the Middle Ages did very little to spread the gospel. Uh, and you can study that in church history. They spent more time fighting. Do you realize that religious wars have shed more blood than, than military world, uh, wars throughout the history of the world. Um, and, and all you got to do is read a little bit about that. They were, they were you know, the, the, when, especially in Roman Catholicism and, and the, uh, you know, the various um, crusades, um, you know, when the kings were in charge of the church, I mean, they, they were just horrible. Uh, cru the crusades were absolutely incredible. Um, and if you ever get a chance to read about it, you should, because it will give you a little bit of insight to church history. Um, they spent more time fighting religious wars, playing politics with the civil rulers. And uh, these churches of this period are not necessarily large or strong. In fact, he says in verse 8, he said, you have little strength, but you've kept my word. Um, they were not necessarily large churches. They were not strong churches, uh, but they did have faith. And they also loved to go through the open doors of service that Christ has opened with his key. In fact, the key of David refers to his authority as the son of David. Uh, and we see, if you look in Isaiah 22, 22, you see where the key is a symbol of authority. Of, uh, and, and of course, the authority was that of Christ. Doors are, I want, I want to pause a minute and just think about these open doors. Um, and doors are closing all around the world. Now, I know we've gone through a period of time where doors to the gospel have been open. But it's important when the Lord opens a door for us that we go through it. It's extremely important, especially in getting the gospel to the world. We have no clue of when those doors will close and it becomes more difficult to spread the gospel. And... Um, and so there are some that are still open. And when Christ opens or shuts a door, the Bible teaches us here that no one, if he opens a door, nobody can shut that door except him. Now I know, I, I, you know, I think I've prefaced several statements with this over the years. Um, we certainly believe in the free will of man, but it does not interfere with the sovereignty of God. Somehow, even when we don't understand how the two can coexist, they do. They do not contradict each other, even though we may not understand it all with our finite minds. And I, I think anybody that says that they totally understand um, the, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, are, they're delusional if they tell you they understand all of that. Because you can't understand all of that. Uh, our minds are finite. All we can do is trust by faith uh, the things that we don't understand um, but one of the things that, that I want you to know is that 
when we say no man can close that door, um, you know, you think about it this way, and we were reminded, I was reminded this week, you do understand that God moves the hearts of kings and man's, man's steps are ordered by the Lord. And yet, we have choices. Um, I have to believe this because I believe in the sovereignty of God. Nothing happens that God does not allow or orchestrate. And, you know, I, I mean, there's things that, you, you think about this. Did Pharaoh have a free will? We believe he did. But God is the one that hardened his heart on several occasions. Now, there's a lot about that I don't understand. Other than God knows everything, some way this will all be reconciled, and we'll understand it by and by. But the Bible, you know, and, and here's another thing we don't understand. While we can choose our rulers, don't ever wish what God is trying to do away. So I'll even say this, even though I can't explain it, so don't ask me to explain it. But even when we have presidents and kings and things, they would not be there if God had not somehow ordained it or allowed it. Even the ones we don't like. Now, does that mean that you did wrong by voting for somebody that goes, you know, that, that you know, your vote doesn't matter? It absolutely matters. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be an active citizen and exercise your free will to do the very best that we can. But the truth is, God is going to orchestrate things to where it will bring about His will. And there's just a lot about that that I have to trust by faith. The, the Bible does tell us, remember this, don't ever forget this, the just live by faith. You can, if you're going to have to have an answer for everything, you're going to be a miserable Christian. Because there's a lot of things we don't have an answer for. A lot of things we can't explain. But, we, but there are a lot of things we can. Nothing wrong with talking about them. Nothing wrong with trying to... But there are some things that we just have to go, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you that you know what you're doing. Now, this church has opposition from the false church. The synagogue of Satan is mentioned here. In fact, they are liars they claim to be the church or, and oppose the ministry of God's people, but Christ promises to bring them to their knees. The false church has popularity, influence, money, but it will one day bow before the saints of God in, the, in this age who are taking the truth to the world. That will happen. Verse 10 is one of the strongest proofs. It says, because thou hast kept... The word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. In fact, most scholars believe that what he's saying is what's getting ready to come up in chapter 4, verses 2 and on, until you see the church again in chapter 19, is that, you know, the church will not go through the great tribulation. Now, here's one thing I want to remind us of. It didn't say we wouldn't go through tribulation. Didn't say we wouldn't go through hardship. But what he's going to do in a seven year period, I believe there is scriptural evidence to believe that the church will be taken out of the world and will not have to go through that. Um, true believers today are part of that Philadelphia church and will not enter that seven year awful judgment on the earth. That is our stance. That, by the way, that is our general stance as free will Baptist, even though all of us who've been free will Baptist for any number of years know that we have many people that do not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. They, some do not believe in the literal thousand year reign. Some do not believe in, um, some believe mid-trib. Um, I just believe there's strong evidence in the scripture that, that the church will be taken out of the world before the great tribulation. Now, I don't split hairs over it. I don't think people are unrighteous if they differ. In fact, most of the Free Will Baptists west of the Mississippi are all millennialists. 
which they believe is no millennial reign. That, you know, after, um, you know, at, when the end comes, it's, that's it. There's no thousand year reign. There's no any of that. And so, um, and, and I don't believe this because I'm scared of the tribulation. Now, I don't, I don't want to go to, through the tribulation. Hey, listen, if you want to go through the tribulation, maybe you can ask the Lord to let you stay back, but I'm not interested. I'm not interested. If you read about it, you, you, you don't want to go through the tribulation period. In fact, that's the reason I believe over and over in Scripture in different phrases we are told to make our calling and election sure because it is not going... And, and, if, and if you're not saved once the rapture happens, there's a good possibility you won't get saved. It'll be very difficult for people. There will be people saved in the tribulation. We know that. But it will not be like it is now where we have the Holy Spirit you know, working and the, the Spirit of God will be taken out of the world and it will be a, a, a verbal witness and, and whatever else God allows. It'll be very difficult to become a Christian and, uh, and as well as God turning the hearts of people away from Him because they've rejected Him. So there's all kinds of things that we could get into that are not in this passage, but I believe that uh, we have some strong evidence because of this church and what we will start in, in chapter 4 that we will be taken out of the world for this time period. Um, the very outline of Revelation, I think, is another proof. Um, for after Revelation 3, there's no mention of the church until 22, 13. Um, and, and chapters 2 and 3 outline the church age. Chapters 4 usher in the tribulation period. And look, I know there are people that have studied Revelation all their life that could stand before you tonight and, and probably talk circles around what I believe. I'm, I'm giving some very basic beliefs. Um, but I think, I, you know, I'm sort of like Rob Morgan believes in his book, The Final 50 Events of World History. I, I don't believe Revelation is as hard to understand as we've made it. You know, if you understand that we are to take it literally until there's a reason not to, if God said it in His Word, it's, it's what it is. And I think sometimes we've tried to make things and interpret things that make it difficult. I don't believe God intended. Listen, if we don't understand it and can't understand it, I think that's the way God intended it to be. And He will reveal it in His time. But we don't need to make it more difficult than it is. And so chapter 4 it ushers in the tribulation period. And the prayer of 2220 would be impossible to pray if we had to wait for the tribulation to come before we would be raptured. Look, look at 2220. He says this, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. We'll get to that. Um, we won't jump ahead there. But that is the, you know, that is the, the general idea of the Church of Philadelphia. They had not denied the Lord. Um, that was something that was commended. They had depended on His strength. Um, you know, they had gone through open doors of ministry. Um, you know, and every church, listen, every church ought to pray for open doors of ministry. We ought to pray, Lord, open doors for us to minister to the people um, in our realm of reach. Open doors for us to minister to people around the world. Um, today many churches think that there are too few people with too little money, too few gifts, and too few opportunities. But um, remember this truth. When we are weak, Christ is strong. And one of the things He said is He said, you've kept My Word, you've been faithful to My Word, and you've walked through these doors of opportunities, but you, you are weak. He, he, didn't, he, he didn't say you're weak and you've done nothing. He just simply said, you know, in, in there, he said, um, let's see, where is it? You have little strength, and yet you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. So, um, you know, we have to remember that building the church of Jesus Christ is up to Him. We are just people that serve Him and, and are able to have a part in it. It's not up to us. We depend on the head of the church to give His body the strength that it needs. 
Uh, verse 8 again summarizes these principles to every church, open doors for ministry, Christ's strength, keeping His Word, being faithful to God's Word will lead to open doors for ministry and dependence on Christ's power. By the way, we heard a good sermon this week about the temptation of Christ. Think about, think about the importance of the Word. What did Christ do to combat the enemy? He quoted the Word. He quoted the Word. And, and uh, it, it was his priority, and it was one of the strengths of the church at Philadelphia. Um, in fact, the Bible co- proclaims the name of Jesus. They believed in his word, and, and truly it's the only name whereby people can be saved, according to Acts 4. So let's go to the Laodicean church. First of all, any questions? I know you're probably going to ask me something that, about something maybe I didn't cover here. Don't forget what the synagogue of Satan is. You know, it was just those that said they were one thing but not another. Uh, some believe there was a temple there that would have represented the synagogue of Satan. Uh, there seemed to be that in almost every city. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I love the fact that he talks about overcoming. Um, you know, we are to endure and overcome. We can do that. And so he goes into probably the church that gets preached on more than anything. And that is the church at Laodicea. And, and so I, I want you to, uh, one thing I, I do want, I hope you will listen to this first part so that you do not misunderstand. Okay? Um, I, was, I was listening to an audio recording today of a book that I've, I've bought online called The Bully Pulpit. And one of the things that I want you to understand is that I do not believe that God set aside um, leaders of the church, especially the messengers that we see in Revelation 7 or the pastors even in today's churches to be bullies. We are not to lord over people. Uh, we are to serve them and help them and love them Um, And so when I say what I'm going to say, I want you to keep that in context because I want you to know what this name means. In in, uh, verse 14, he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. By the way, in my opinion, after studying this, cold does not represent a cold, dead spirituality. Hot does not represent... He said, I want you to be one or the other. There's a background to that. He he did not want them to be like the tepid waters where cold water and hot water ducts, warm water ducts would come and be stagnant and would mix in together. And, and it was not good drinking water. And he said, if, if you're going to be like that spiritually, I'm going to spit you out like people would spit out that tepid water. And it had to do a, a historical meaning. I, I, I think for years, even myself, I preached this as though if you were cold, you were spiritually dead. If you were hot, you were on fire for God. And that was just a bad interpretation of Scripture. Not what he's talking about. And so I corrected that. Uh, maturity and hopefully a little more study did that for me. But he says, um, you're neither cold nor hot. I, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, now notice, here is a verse I want you to think about. Who is he talking to here? The church. Not lost people. Now that didn't mean there weren't some lost people that mingle it. We know that from our own local churches. Don't think that just because everybody sits in church on Sunday that they're born again. That's not true. We know that. We know that because we've known people to get up out of their pew that have been there for years and come and get saved when the Holy Spirit would convict them. 
And so uh, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Christ is on the outside of this body of people. He's asking not to come into the heart of an unregenerate person. He's asking to be invited back into his own church, which is a horrible indictment of the church. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup or fellowship or eat with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with the Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, here's where I'm going to tell you what I, based on the name of Laodicea, I'm just going to share this with you. And I hope that not only have I proven myself as your pastor, but I hope you will understand what I mean by the teaching. The name Laodicea means the rule of the people. And it suggests, a de- Warren Wiersbe says, it suggests a democratic church that no longer followed its spiritual leaders who were leading on the authority of the word. Did you hear that? By the way, don't go home and say, Pastor said we shouldn't vote on anything, that we shouldn't have a say-so on anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the church was not, when when it came to the spiritual well-being of the church, it was not created to be a democracy. It was created for spiritual people to lead a church on the authority, not of their word, not of my word, but the authority of the word of God. And I believe when that happens, and, and I think what happens is when that doesn't happen, when people don't follow their leaders that have been uh, you know, placed over them as the overseer or the bishop or however, you know, whatever, the elder, the pastor, whatever, it leads to issues. And especially, it's no different than what Paul said. There was nobody that believed people ought to follow Jesus more than Paul. But Paul said to his followers, follow me as I follow Christ. He was not inviting them to follow the frailty of man. He was simply saying, and I believe I can paraphrase him and be accurate. He was saying, if I'm following Christ and I'm preaching the word, you follow me. I can be your example. And Sure. And it is assumed... It is assumed that the spiritual leader will be following Christ. It is assumed. It's not saying follow a man blindly. That's what what happens. What happens when you follow a man blindly is what happened in Jonestown. Nobody's telling you to drink Kool-Aid. And I, I, I know that sounds crazy, but by the way, that's exactly... Two things. Number one, when the congregation is so spiritually immature that they will follow anything a man says, that's a problem. And the second problem is, is if a man thinks he's got enough authority that his word is the authority, that's a problem. The authority that I lead any church, any group of people, even in my own home, should, be, should rest in the authority of the word. And if I try to lead anybody in any way that is not based on the truth of the Word of God, we are, you, you know, a church is not obligated to follow that. Not obligated to follow that. And I know some of my, some of my conservative buddies would argue with me on that. But I'm telling you, there is nobody, laity or pastor, that, that is perfect always makes, and and I don't think you should expect perfection, but we are not a democracy when it comes to spirituality. We may be a democracy when it comes to the color of the carpet, and and we present something and you want to vote for it, or we we want to choose it, or if we're going to do something, there's always that element of it. In fact, the Bible says that, that He gives gifts to people in administration. So we're not talking about that. The problem in Laodicea was not that they were trying to make decisions that were, you know, just how how are we going to do this or how are we going to do it? No, they were were disobeying. They had lost their spiritual fervor 
And they began to just do what they wanted to do. It was sort of like the Israelites that said, you know, that, that the Bible says they began to do what was right in their own eyes. They were not following. Same thing happened when Moses led them. And by the way, Moses was held to, a, you know, we're held to an account. I, I, I take very seriously what I lead our church to do spiritually and what I say when I'm teaching you. Take that very seriously because I have a stricter judgment. Listen, before you decide you want to volunteer to teach Sunday school or teach a class, you, you need to read up what the Bible says. You're going to teach, you're going to face a stricter judgment. Just saying. But they were not following their spiritual leaders who, were, who no doubt were leading them on the authority of the Word of God. I like what Warren Wiersbe said, it's Protestantism turned away from the truth. The church is lukewarm. It's a condition that comes when you mix hot and cold. Now, you know, you may get so thirsty sometimes it don't matter. But I'm going to tell you something. I just don't normally go to the sink to get a drink of warm water. I mean, it's not very refreshing, right? Now, you know, I do get, I will get, there's things that I use really cold water for. And there's things that I use. And, and look, don't, please don't bring up the example of your washing machine. I know it mixes them and you can wash them in warm water. But that's not what we're talking about. Most of the time, you're either going to, you're going to use something for hot or you're going to be cold. But most of the time, there's not a lot of use for warm water when it comes to us refreshing ourselves. And so the tragedy is this church is rich and does not know that their truth is diluted with error. I dealt with an employee a few weeks ago, not in this church. I wouldn't even say it if they were in this church. That said, I want you to believe my truth. I said, it's not a matter of my truth or your truth. It's a matter of the truth. This is the truth. This is not my truth. This is God's truth. And if I say it's my truth, it's only because I've been able to accept it as my truth and go, this is my truth too. But this, it doesn't, this does not become truth. It's not based on whether I accept it or not. This is true whether I accept it or not. I've heard people say, well, I've never been convicted of that. If the Bible says it's wrong or right, it doesn't matter whether you've ever been convicted or not. You don't have to be convicted over something for it to be wrong or to be right. And so the city of Laodicea was known, think about it, it was known for wool, wealth, medicine, and he used all these images in verse 18. He wanted to, to give them the true riches of the Word of God, the garments of grace, and the ability to see spiritual things. He talked about the salve. They had, they, in this lukewarm state, they had, they had, they had, um, they had created a condition of blindness. They saw them, themselves one way, and they were not that way at all. Um, and so there was something wrong with their values, their vesture, their vision. And if they would not repent, he would chasten them in love. By the way, I am so grateful tonight, as, as bad as it hurts, I am so grateful tonight that when God loves me and I get out of line, he chastens me. Amen. I look back on my life as a kid. I didn't like spankings. I didn't like when the car keys were taken away from me. But I'm going to tell you something. Today, I can, I can tell you several things about my own character that would have never been what they are today had somebody that loved me not chastened me. And I can't imagine, I'm still working on my character, and I can't imagine where I would be if somebody didn't love me enough to chasten me. In fact, verse 20, again, is often used as a gospel invitation. And, and this application is fine. I don't think it's wrong to look at a lost person and say, Jesus is knocking at the door of your life, and if you'll open it up, he'll, he'll fellowship. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just don't think it's the right interpretation of the use of it. 
But the basic interpretation is that Christ stands outside the door of the apostate church or at least a backslidden church. The church has wealth and power, but no Christ. He's even willing to come into the life of one man if that one man will invite him. He said, if anyone will come in, I'll fellowship with him and he with me. And how tragic it is that a church can become so lukewarm and proud that Christ has to leave and stand outside. They are totally indifferent toward Christ. I'm going to, I probably am preaching to the choir tonight. But I think one of the biggest problems in the modern day church, at least in my neck of the woods, and what I know, you know, the, 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 the small sphere of influence that I've had, and I'll say it tonight as your pastor, I think one of the greatest problems in our own church is indifference. Is indifference. What does it matter if you hadn't read your Bible all week? What does it matter if you only come to church two or three times a month or every six months or Christmas and Easter? What does it matter? What does it matter if you pray only when you're in trouble or you have a need? And by the way, I I think all of us deal sometimes with indifference. They honored leaders that were not godly, not honoring Christ. He's left outside of their plans. Let me tell you something. The church in America today is preaching an inverted gospel. Jesus said, follow me. He did not say, make your plans and I'll follow you. That's an inverted gospel. Jesus said, take up your cross and what? Follow me. The disciples did not decide where they wanted to go and then ask Jesus to come along. Think about when he went to the mountain. He didn't beg people to go. He said, I'll be right over there. If you want to go, you come follow me. But I'm not going to drag you, I'm not going to pull you, I'm not going to force you. But what we have done as a lukewarm church in, in, in our setting, and I can't speak for the rest of the world because I don't minister in the rest of the world, but I'm sure that some of it goes on in other places, is that we've made a bunch of plans and invited God in on them. That's, that's, that's backwards. That's backwards. And it's not wrong to plan. But the first thing in a plan is we ought to say is, Lord, where are you leading me? What are you asking me to do? That's what Paul said. He didn't say, Lord, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'll serve you, but you you need to come with me. No, when when God got a hold of, of Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul said, what would you have me do? He it was it was all Jesus or nothing. And I believe sometimes, just to help you understand that I don't think God's an ogre, I believe God would let us do some of the things that we like to do. I think we've got a bad picture of God. Like He's going to make us, you know, he's just, His desire is just to make us miserable with His will. I don't believe that. You know, the Bible says He created all things for us to enjoy. I, I, think, I think God sometimes gives us exactly what we want if we are honoring Him with it. And our goal is to follow Him, not for Him to, to try to get in on our plans. Indifference. These apostate churches had just left Him outside of the door. Of the building. They all exist today. All seven of them are a picture of church history. And all of them probably, all the characteristics of these churches probably can be found today. Busy churches have left their first love, finally ending as churches that are lukewarm towards Christ. 
False doctrines begin in a small way, but when they grow and infect the entire church, it's very detrimental. There is a, a true remnant in every church. The overcomers in each church are mentioned. And they are responsible to be faithful to Christ until He returns. It's been pointed out by some Bible students that the promises to the overcomers in these chapters trace for us Old Testament history. The tree of life. Man was cast out of the garden to die. The manna of the wilderness wanderings. The kingdom age of Israel. The priestly ministry. The temple. The glorious throne of Solomon. It is as though Christ gathers up the history of Israel and applies it to the people of today in the church age. But notice the importance of God's Word to the churches. Seven times Christ calls the churches to hear what the Spirit says. Let me ask you something. When is the last time that you really believed that the Holy Spirit was prompting you or speaking to you when you knew it was Him? And I don't want you to answer that out loud. When we stop listening to the voice of the Spirit and start listening to the voices of men, people begin to turn away from the truth. We live in a noisy world. There are things that come out. Look, just trying to study for sermons, even in a building that is filled with Christians, it gets noisy. You just have to sometimes go. And I know sometimes people have probably thought I'm rude, but I've told my wife, keep everybody out. I'm in a groove. I need to hear from God. Sometimes I've stayed home to do that. Because it just, even, look, all noise isn't bad noise. But sometimes we get so busy, we wouldn't know if the Spirit was speaking to us or not. We must not deny the faith, turn away from the truth. It can cost us our lives. We must keep His Word. We see that in, in verse 8 and 10. And not deny His name. All of this is a progression. It don't just start. Even, even with Peter. You know, what, you know how it started with Peter? Now I know Peter did not deny Him in the same way that, that Judas betrayed Him. I, I get that. And Peter turned around and, and became a, a, a great leader of, of people and, and uh, you know, spread the gospel, preached the great message at Pentecost. But you know where it started? Peter just didn't start with his denial of knowing the Lord at that moment. You know where I think it started? With his arrogance. Not me, Lord. I'm more spiritual than that. I'll never deny you. Listen, you're already in trouble if you say you will never do something. Because if you don't listen to the Spirit of God and you don't follow the prompting of God's Spirit, you and I are capable of anything. Anything. But we must keep His Word. We must not deny His name. Because apart from the Word of God, there is no life nor hope for the churches. That's how important His Word is. Um, he talks about spiritual nakedness. It's really a symbolism of humiliation and defeat. They pretended to be clothed in righteousness. Um, spiritual blindness. Christ was actually presenting a paradox the city was famous for its export of powder that created an eye salve when mixed with water. It had some medical benefits. But the Laodicean church had lost its spiritual perception. They couldn't even perceive what was spiritual anymore. And the only salve for spiritual blindness is repentance and submission to the Lord and, and asking Him for wisdom to restore our sight. He says, be zealous and repent. It's almost like he's saying, you run to the altar. And, and then he waits for the invitation. 
You know, I, I want to encourage you tonight because when you talk about Laodicea and Philadelphia, Philadelphia is a little more encouraging, but there's not much encouraging about Laodicea. Um, I just would not want to be called a Laodicean church. But I will tell you this. I do not believe at Great Bridge Free Will Baptist Church that Jesus is standing on the outside of the church. I don't believe that. I believe we see many, many good things happening that are led by the Spirit. We see lives being changed and people wanting to be a part of the church and wanting to learn and grow and all of that. We see all of that. But we certainly do not need to become arrogant and think that it wouldn't take long for Him to step right outside the door. Because that's what pride and arrogance will do. And we need not, I know I've said this to myself, but I say it to you, we need not think that any of us are the reason for His blessings. It's His Word. It's truth. And I believe when we stand on His Word and we stand for truth and we preach the Word and we preach the truth and we don't have an inverted gospel, we have a gospel that says that we teach people that Jesus says, follow me. In fact, even with these kids that I've been baptizing, their parents will tell you one of the things that I've told them is you are making a decision for life. You, this is not something to play around with. You are to start right now following Jesus. Do you understand that? I don't just, I don't just act like, oh yeah, here's another one we can baptize. They know. We open the scripture. We talk to them. We ask them. And I don't tell them. And the parents don't either. I've been really proud of the parents who don't tell them that they're saved. They want them to know how to say it themselves. I was thankful you know, that my father would not let me get baptized until he knew that I knew that I was born again. Not because mom and dad were born again. That's salvation by heritage. And nobody gets saved by heritage. And so I believe the Lord is in our church fellowshipping with us. That doesn't mean we're perfect. Because if you've got people, none of us are sinless. None of us have reached sinless perfection. But I do believe that the Lord's in the midst. And I want to encourage you. Let's keep Him in the midst of our congregation. Let's keep Him in the midst of our lives individually because that's where it really starts. It's a relationship with Him. Let's not be, let's not be lukewarm. Man, what, can you imagine what that messenger must have felt is when the Lord told him to tell your church this. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Basically what he said is I'm going to vomit you up. It's not a pretty picture. I don't think any church would want to have that description of them that the Lord would say to you, if you're going to be lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And uh, I hope not only that that's a challenge tonight, but also an encouragement that, that we, we can have. He, he desires close, intimate fellowship with us, not only as individuals, but collectively as part of his body. And I'm thankful tonight that he does. Any questions, thoughts? I know what time it is, and you may not want to extend the service. Uh, okay. Okay. Now that we've gone through all these churches, are these places that existed, or is, are these metaphors? No, they existed. They were cities. Okay. They were cities in Asia Minor. Okay, I thought so. So then, here is it being used as a metaphor and a message to, or is it just? Well, when the when the um, when the letter was written, many of these places were still in existence. And some of the places are in existence now. They're just, there's just no church there in a lot of instances. Yeah, that's kind of, kind of but I do believe it was teaching us something for the future as well. Okay. It was representative, but it, they were real places. Okay, yeah, I thought that's why, because it's in Revelation, and I, I guess I was confused because Revelation hasn't happened yet, so that's why I was just... Well, some of it has. Remember, it was what was, what is, and what is to come. So some of it has happened, and some of it we're in the middle of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Brother Thurman? Yeah. I just come to realize, well, I'm not studying, uh, I guess I already know it, but these churches, 
churches were not around Jerusalem. Mm -mm. They were Gentile churches. Yeah, most of them were. Yes. And, uh, you know, even though, I mean, they were Paul's territory <laughs> where he made his missionary trips. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that every time he talks about they say they're Jews and they're not, um, there's a lot of people that believe it's insinuating that he, they're trying to convert the Gentiles back to Judaism, you know, and that was the false teaching of the day, and he said, don't do that. He said, they're liars, they're, you know, which, which is still, listen, works salvation is still prevalent in, in, even in, among Christianity today, but especially in most of the other false religions, it's... You know, it, it is a, you know, almost every religion in the world is a works salvation in their mind. But it has crept over still, and there are still Christians that I really believe are Christians who struggle with wondering if they've done enough to be saved. And it, it still is a, it's still a problem. And that's the reason Paul said, beware of dogs. He wasn't talking about domesticated animals that we like to love on. He called dogs those who tried to add works to 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 sanct or to uh, justification, and he he called them dogs. They were they were ravaging beasts in that day. You did not want to hang around a dog. That was not a, a nice thing to be called. Um, and he called false teachers dogs. And and said, beware of those. Great thought. And good question. Yeah. And, and I would just say one of the cardinal rules of studying Revelation is take it literally until there's a reason not to. Okay. I was wondering, there seems to be a, a, a theme of blindness of this perception <laughs> of being wealthy. It's interesting that you're looking at verse 17 um, in chapter 4 and then going back to the persecuted church. In verse 9, it says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And then speaking to this, that you are uh, miserable, wretched, <coughs> poor, blind, and naked. And it's, it's interesting seeing how he strikes Paul with blindness and even thinking that he saw so much as a Pharisee and his legalism persecuting the church. And when he heals blind men, this this kind of inversion of between the lukewarm church and the persecuted church, mm -hmm. which I'd say likely for America, we're going persecution's probably coming. So it's it's an interesting to see those things in parallel. Yeah, I, let me tell you how blind, and I, I'll close here. I, I know, I promise. Let me tell you how blind people are today, and I'm not even going to say that they're part of the church because I don't know. I don't know them. But spiritual blindness is evident in a lot of situations. But one of the coaches of one of the championship teams over the past week in March Madness made the comment when, when the mic was, was hot on, you know, up, up to her in her interview. She said, our God is so good. Our God is so good. But the same day made the comment that transgender athletes ought to be able to play women's sports. Now, we should, that should break our hearts. We should understand that that could very well be coming from a, a spiritually blind person. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the things that we must stand for are always easy and they're not always politically correct. But we have to stand on the truth. We have to stand on the truth. Standing on the truth does not mean that we hate or that we're not kind. It simply means we stand on the authority of the Bible. Victoria? Laodicea.
Right. So now, here I am today, under this roof, with my Bible open, and it's a different, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. Uh, and I see the difference. Um, and so this um, chapter and all these verses in that chapter make so much sense. Mm. Um, Yeah. So let me just this may this may shock people to hear me say this because I believe there are pastors and preachers that might not would say this and I don't pat myself on the back. I've just I've grown up in some influence where the preacher said it is gospel. You got to be careful with that. I expect when you hear me preach for you to go home and figure out for yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit if what I'm saying is true. That's called a Berean Christian. The Bereans loved the preaching that they were hearing. It's not that I would think that none of you don't believe what I preach. That's not what I'm saying. But every believer, remember we believe in the priesthood of the believers. You should never take a, a sermon and not go back and go, I'm going to study that and see what, you know, I, I, not, not because you doubt. It, it's not an attitude of, I don't know whether he's telling me the truth. It's an attitude of you getting in the word for yourself. And the Bereans, the Bible says, they would go and study to make sure the things they were hearing were accurate. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not offended by that. In fact, any pastor worth their salt would want their people to do that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a human. I, there can be, I told you, I, I interpreted that for years the wrong way. Now, I don't, you know, I don't think it was the kind of thing that would have kept somebody from being saved, but it sure helped me understand maybe what one of the problems in the church was a little differently because I learned and grew. And, and actually, I'm thankful that was one reason I enjoyed homiletics. If we preach something, you better believe Jack Stallings and, and some of those guys would say, no, that wasn't right. You know, and I'm thankful for men who taught me how to interpret the Scripture and, and relay it, and I'm still trying to get better at it. I mean, I, I promise you, I'm trying to get better at it. Even after 38 years of preaching, I don't want you to just accept blindly what I say. I want you to go home and study it and say, I want to I research that myself. I, I really pray that people don't leave on Sunday and that's the last time they look at the passage. I hope they go home and do it more than that. Brother Thurman, did you have your hand up? Uh, oh, okay. Also, the Bible is complete. Yes. But there's a lot of good commentaries absolutely. out there that explain things that are not explained in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's word studies. You know, we have an English translation. That's not, the, that's not the, the language that the Bible was written in. You know, but that doesn't mean we don't have an inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. It just means that you can look up Greek. You know, Greek words had far, far stretching meaning than just English words that can help us understand. You know, for instance, the word conversation or conduct in some passages in the, in the King James Version or the English versions, deal with, you know, we think conduct just deals with you see somebody acting out something. The word conduct in the Greek means everything you do, including your mouth, what you say. It's not just what you do. So there's all kinds of things that there are. Great commentaries, if you want to know, if anybody ever wants to know, um, I would like to sort of help you, guide you on that because there's some bad ones out there too of people that want to lead you away from it. But there are so many good ones and that can help you. And so I hope, you know, I hope you'll be a student of the Word. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It doesn't just say, read the Bible. So study it. Meditate on it. 
All right, before y'all shoot me, let's stand up and we'll be dismissed. The, in fact, I don't know if they're just having fun down there or they're waiting on me. So uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, just the class tonight and thank you for these who've come and are excited about your word. And I just thank you for the power of your word. Help us to learn it, to study it, to meditate on it, to love it. Help us not to ever deny it or to deny your name. Give us strength when we're weak. Uh, Lord, we want to follow you, and uh, we ask that you would help us uh, each and every day. Uh, help us to depend on you, and uh, help us to just live out your word and, and, and put your word in our minds and in our hearts. You tell us that thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And so help us to, to love your word, to love these kinds of studies, and may you uh, help us as we go forward to even become more like you and conform to your image in Jesus name. Amen. You can um, let me send out an email. Yeah, let me send out an email. Are you willing to drive that the shuttle? I'll send out an email.